Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And we are about two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Caroline Hyde, Taylor Riggs, counting you down to the closing bell. Here to help us take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast. There's Carol Masser and it's Mike Regan it is, who is in for Tim Stenovic. And we want to go across our audiences of TV, radio and YouTube to dissect what is a day of yields pushing higher, of volatility across the pond and of volatility in the equity markets. I want to push beyond the bell to Saturday. I don't know about you guys because yes. it has been a dense, yeah. dense <laughs> day, dense week again. Uh, really broad based for the most part in terms of selling. And I'm going to go back to what I talked about earlier. Uh, semiconductors continuing to outperform, certainly seeing it in LAM research, and you're seeing it in the SOC still holding on to a slight gain, well off its highs, though, but Mike, still up about eight-tenths of a percent. Yeah, Carol, and I've got one number in mind right now, and that is the number five, five percent. The Fed funds <laughs> futures are finally fully pricing in a terminal rate of 5%, and even a little bit higher. And not only that, Taylor, they're also not really pricing in much of a cut for next year. So uh, markets right now pricing a 5% interest rate on Fed fund futures starting in March and mm. pretty much staying there for most of the year, Taylor. Mike, what does the 3666 on the S&P mean to you as well when we think about the significance of these numbers? That was the big June lows. We seem to retest that a few times, dip below it. Now we're right back there. Yeah, right. And we just ha had Abigail Doolittle, uh, our colleague, on saying, uh, do not expect that low uh, earlier this month to hold. She's expecting even lower lows, Taylor. Lower lows at the moment. We are below that 366 number. As we hear the closing bells, we're off by 8 tenths percent. We just dip into that closing bell. Eight seconds until trade halts and we're at 3,665. So where we trade on the S&P 500, 31 points, let's call it 30 points to the downside. That is eight tenths percent lower. Bloomingdale's ringing that bell over at the moment. And we're seeing, though, still no love for any of the benchmarks. The Nasdaq's off by six tenths of percent. We see the Dow Jones Industrial Average off by three tenths percent, just 91 points lower. And then we have a look at the Ross 2000, which has been an underperformer throughout the day of trade, off by more than 1.2 percent. Yeah, an interesting, Caroline, with a day with, uh, again, another bout of volatility. Maybe we understand why it happened, but nonetheless, um, some swings here. The VIX moving down, Taylor, just a little bit, down about half a point, staying at about 30. Take a look at where we are on the sector level, Carol, because you have a few names in the green, but it's really not much home to write home about when you think about the breadth of the sell-off. Telecoms are uh, the big outperformer today. You're at 3%. Otherwise, it's semiconductor software and energy. Wow, am I a broken record or what? <laughs> energy is still one of the top performers here, but you're only up about one to two tenths of 1%. Everything else is in the red, Carol, and this is sort of the significance, even though we're not getting a 2 to 3% sell-off, you're getting some decent number sectors that are still in the red. I'll bring you down to the bottom. Some of this does feel like that inflation story with household products, utilities, transportation. We've talked a lot about the weak numbers from Union Pacific as we wait CSX. And then those key auto components as well. You're off about 5.7%. I'm looking at you, Tesla. Uh, Tesla, right? down, what, 6.7%, so pretty significant decline there. All right, let's get to some of the gainers. Actually, um, some real big outperformers, despite so many names lower in today's session, and that includes LAM Research, up more than 11% at its highs today, finishing the day with a 7.8% uh, gain, top in the S&P 500, NASDAQ. We talked about the earnings briefly last night. Semi, a capital equipment company, the first quarter results that did beat, and it also gave an outlook that analysts said should result in a more realistic consensus uh, expectations, reducing some downside risk. So there was some upgrades from the analyst community. Others cut their price target, but that reset about maybe what our expectations should be for the semi sector. Analysts really liking what they heard. IBM outperformance up 4.7 percent. Sales topping at estimates, affirming its cash flow forecast. Our Anurag Rana saying that was an important thing and a sign that demand for software, mainframe computers, and hybrid cloud services remain steady. So there was a strong uh, turn in today's trade. AT&T, one of the older, old guard, if you will, when it comes to the equity universe, up uh, almost 8% in today's session, top of the S&P 500, uh, biggest gain since the early days of the pandemic after reporting better than expected profit and customer growth. It was up, you guys, up more than 10% at its highs today, uh, Mike. Yeah, Carol, let me get back to Tesla. Uh, bad day for Tesla, obviously down 6.7%. Boy, third quarter sales still rose 56% to 
21.5 billion, but that wasn't good enough for analysts. They expected 22.1. Um, Elon Musk acknowledging that the downturn in China and Europe and the Federal Reserve's interest rates increases all the things we've been talking about are having an effect, saying demand's a little harder than it would be otherwise. Uh, the other big dramatic move today, all state shares down 13%. That's the most since 2020. Insurer basically saying that it expects a third quarter net loss of as much as 725 million. Hurricane Ian claims from that is one issue, but really inflation is uh, that nasty word popping up again, even for an insurance company. Piper uh, Sandler analysts saying they just struggled in recent quarters to get ahead of accelerating claims inflation. And finally, Union Pacific Corp fell 6.8%. Another sort of macro warning here from this company. They cut their forecast for volume growth to reflect a, quote, challenging year, uh, adding their concerns about inflation and bo bloated inventories. Uh, they expect car load volumes to increase roughly 3% this year, down from an earlier forecast of as much as 5%. Meanwhile, we look across the board of global macro movers. I look at an FX space that is once again a story of dollar strength on the day. This is we see the Federal Reserve members. This time, perhaps coming from Elisa Cook on one side, you also get utterings coming from the Fed governor over in Philadelphia, Harker, talking about where the terminal rate will have to go for this year and maybe continue to go higher at at least a 4% by the end of this year. We see dollar strength. That means weakness. Swedish krona, Norwegian krona, Japanese yen busting through that 150 level. Of course, all important as to what the BOJ and indeed other authoritative figures over in Japan do to try and, well, get some sort of strength within their currency that, of course, they're somewhat worried about the amount of weakness. I'm looking at commodities that, of course, have been topsy-turvy. We did have some hopes, some utterances, some rumours that maybe China would be looking towards alleviating some of those quarantine periods. That did well for the likes of oil that pushed a little bit higher and sustained a little bit of the day. It was up as much as 3%. We bought dialed back from that. Metals got a lift, perhaps. Iron ore is up 1.5%. We're also seeing the natural gas falling back lower for no more than 2%. Again, and finally, some production alleviating some of the concerns. We do see the pricing pressure on that gas come off here in the US. Sovereign bonds are a mixed picture. You have money sort of in the UK. We saw some stability in the gilt yields at least. But over in Japan, we saw yields push higher, for example. And indeed in Canada, they were up some 12 basis points. Huge story. That is the same, Caroline, within full faith and credit. I think it is fascinating that earlier, just a few days ago, we were looking to see if a 30-year could hold on to that 4% level. And we've really started to drift upwards. A 460 on the two-year, a four and a quarter on the 10-year, and almost 4.23% on a 30-year. So you're really well above 4%. I think it's interesting. We're also getting some um, interesting earnings as well. Uh, Carol, I know that you're looking at a few. I'll yeah. just quickly hit CSX as well. A better top margin, bottom line, $3.9 billion for third quarter revenue ahead of estimates, better operating income, and a better bottom line, $0.52 cents a share relative to estimates of 49 And they're coming out and saying that they still are targeting full year, double-digit revenue operating income growth. A good improvement here for that company. You know, one stock, too, that was a definitely a pandemic play, Whirlpool, right? Really, when everybody was living at home, they were buying lots of appliances. Well, it's a different tone, certainly, mm. in this latest earnings report. Stock down almost 6% here in the after hours. And it has to do largely, too, with the outlook. Seeing fiscal year ongoing EPS, we're talking about $19. It had seen 22 to 24. The estimate on the street was 21.85. So cutting that year ongoing EPS view. You know, Caroline, I think think about, right? This was something that just couldn't keep up with really demand during the pandemic. This stock, by the way, did hit a 52-week low in the regular session and says elevated inflation resulted in slowing demand. Whirlpool saying it sees challenges persisting into the first half of 2023. So again, here's something when it comes to outlook. It yes. has a strategic review uh, when it comes to some of the emerging markets and other markets uh, nearing a conclusion. Yeah, in EMEA, so that's Europe, Middle East, and Africa. It's interesting that they talk about this challenge of 2023. That seems to be the narrative coming from some CEOs. It's fine for the time being, but next year is when the headwinds are really going to hit from a demand perspective. Adidas over in Germany talking about, of course, a dialing back in demand overall. And as you say, this is such a pandemic darling as everyone was so desperate to get their hands on new go goods, but notably the housing rollover, the fact that we are seeing concerns coming to the cracks forming in the US housing and real estate sector, and indeed worldwide as rates push higher, that's got to be an overall headwind on this.
this company. Yeah, and also I point out uh, Tenant Healthcare uh, out with uh, guidance saying they see f uh, fiscal year adjusted uh, EBITDA of 3.38 billion to 3.48 billion, a little bit of a tighter range than the 3.38 to 3.58 billion that they saw. But boy, the stock is not taking it well, down about almost nine percent in uh, post market trading there, Carol. All right, so certainly some names to follow into the Friday trade, as you said, Tenant down about eight percent. All right, folks, that's a wrap. A lot going on. Wrapping up some of the earnings after the close. We will be back. Our cross-platform coverage, radio, TV, YouTube, Beyond the Bell. We will catch you again, same time, same place, tomorrow.